cardiology, who cardiologist at Denver Health Medical Center. Also a co-principal investigator for the cerebrovascular heart failure and rheumatic disease. Cardiology faculty in Zimbabwe and will Um, um, what I'm what I'm going to do today really is just kind of talk about what we've been doing um, as part of this program in Zimbabwe for the past four four and a half years, and in so doing, in sort of telling this story, I'd like to try to make a couple of larger points. One is a point about non-communicable disease. Uh, the global South and the role that that plays um, in how we think about global health, and then to maybe make some inferences about what I think some of our focus should be in trying to improve the health of the world at large. Um, and I've purposely included fewer slides than I normally would for about an hour's talk um, so that there'll be time for discussion at the end. So, um, I usually, you know, there's usually you have an acknowledgement slide at the end. I'm putting mine up front just because it's so important for people, I think, to understand that um, how um, dependent, you know, this work has been on the work of others. And so we have two uh, primary co uh, investigators in Zimbabwe, James Hakim and John Matanga, um, really phenomenal physicians, have uh, struggled on at the medical school there through um, thick and thin, mostly thin, um, and really are the basis for this grant happening. Close behind that acknowledgement is Tom Campbell, who's infectious disease here, who is, I think, responsible for the longstanding partnership uh, between faculty here in Colorado and faculty in Zimbabwe. Um, Tom's been uh, engaged for well over 15 years and really was the person who drew most of us into this project. So really, those are the guys that get the credit. I just kind of <clears throat> and then I uh, have a list of other people from the uh, University of Colorado faculty who have been uh, our visiting professors in, uh, as part of this program. Most of them are from cardiology. We also have people in endocrine and uh, pulmonary medicine, and I'll talk about that at the very end. And that's a picture of um, Victoria Falls, which is Bobway's uh, uh, <clears throat> biggest tourist attraction. So this program that we have, uh, this uh, program in, in developing cardiovascular disease faculty, I'll start by with the big picture here. This is part of something called the Medical Education Partnership Initiative that I think um, there's been some discussion about here um, at this forum previously. But basically, this is a program that grew out of PEPFAR. And I'm assuming you all know what PEPFAR is. Um, and is designed to build capacity in medical schools in sub-Saharan Africa. And so they, it was a competitive grant-related program jointly funded by PEPFAR, which is a State Department initiative, as well as uh, the Fogarty Center at the NIH, to um, uh, create partnerships between U.S. medical schools and sub-Saharan African medical schools. And... Um, there were uh, 12 of these awarded. These are the countries that they're in. Um, there was a uh, uh, requirement that the, the, the focus of these partnerships be around the PEPFAR priority conditions, HIV, TB, malaria. Um, there was also an opportunity to apply for linked awards, which are about 20% the size of their original awards in non-communicable disease. And, um, we here in Colorado applied for a linked award in cardiovascular disease, uh, part, uh, other partners uh, that the University of Zimbabwe has in <clears throat> University College London applied for um, a linked award in mental health um, conditions. And we're the only of these countries that got two linked awards. Everybody else got zero or one. So um, we were pretty um, happy off the bat that we had a really broad and solid program set up. Um, <clears throat> the program really, I think, is designed to address this problem on this slide. So the, the top panel is 
uh, region sized by the burden of disease. And uh, Africa, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, really dominates this map, doesn't it? That the uh, uh, population burden of disease in that part of the world is far greater than it is elsewhere. Um, and that contrasts with the uh, size of the healthcare uh, workers, um, so the healthcare workforce that is able to meet this demand of disease. And if you, you know, put a thumb over South Africa there, um, there would be um, very, very few healthcare workers of any type available to treat this very high burden of disease. And so the recognition or the thinking was that in order to attack this problem of a high burden of disease, you first need to develop healthcare workers. Um, and even more narrowly, that the thinking was that physicians were the first step in developing a robust healthcare um, workforce for, um, for Africa. Um, so talk about, but I, I've kind of bought into that whole concept as that's the way to go. Um, and um, so, before, so that's the sort of program more broadly. Now I want to sort of talk about our our program more narrowly. Um, and I think context is everything. Um, and one of the first things I learned when I started to do this work, um, uh, my daughter constantly reminded me that Africa is not a country. You know that there's a lot of difference within. Uh, places in Africa. So it's important to understand the place that you're working in. So um, to me, these are uh, the three phases, the three real uh, phases of the history of this particular country. So um, the guy on the left up there, it's Cecil Rhodes, um, the uh, man who gave his name to Rhodes Scholars, um, probably one of the world's foremost imperialists uh, um, of the last several hundred years. Um, was responsible for European colonization of this particular part of Africa. His a megalomaniacal dream was uh, a railroad that stretched from Cape Town to Cairo, um, surrounded by British territory. And so um, moving north from uh, their base in South Africa, really pretty late, pretty late in the game, 1890s, um, first sent um, settlers north uh, into this territory um, and uh, uh, really stretched the, the British colonization into what is now Zimbabwe, uh, claiming this for the British Empire, um, and was a uh, British colony into the 1960s. And here the story gets um, a little bit more interesting. So as I'm sure most of you know, there's this sudden wave of decolonization of Africa that stretched from, started in like 1950. First, um, it was the beginning and it happened very rapidly. The dominoes fell very rapidly, except in a couple places. One of those places was uh, the territory that was uh, called uh, Rhodesia, um, where the uh, white settlers, primarily of uh, British ancestry, uh, basically refused to decolonize. And they, um, the negotiation sort of dragged on for a while, uh, and they unilaterally declared independence from Britain and became a separate country, sort of a pariah rogue state that nobody else in the world had anything to do with. Uh, civil war that lasted about 15 years and um, ultimately failed. Um, and uh, Rhodesia was no more, was reborn as the country of Zimbabwe, with one of the two major rebel leaders as its uh, uh, president, uh, Robert Mugabe, who has been president ever since. He is now 91 years old and has um, maintained uh, control of the government for a very, very long time. Uh, talk more about that situation later if, if, that, if it comes up. Um, <clears throat> and so... The history, so initially, you know, this part of the world, Rhodesia, Zimbabwe, very prosperous, um, was a net food exporter to the rest of the continent. Um, things went along pretty well for quite some time into the 1990s when the economy started not doing as well. And the response on the part of the government was to um, do things that, in retrospect, 
and actually probably in prospect, would um, accelerate economic decline rather than counter it. So um, as a result of uh, not really being able to uh, uh, reimburse his uh, the uh, political elite in the country, uh, land that was uh, under the control of large, large in, um, agricultural producing farms were redistributed, were taken from their largely white owners and given over to um, a variety of other people. So these very productive uh, revenue generating, uh, uh, food generating uh, farms uh, began to not produce as much, which produced further economic decline. The response to that was to print money, uh, print money. And as I'm sure you know, that is not a good thing in the long term. So this economic downturn really accelerated rapidly. And on the right, you see those two banknotes there. The top one's for 20 Zimbabwean dollars. The next one is from, I think, like about 2009, something like that. I hope you can read that. It says $100 trillion. Um, that's kind of what happened with uh, this uh, hyperinflation um, that occurred. And I'm told that um, you needed like a suitcase full of those $100 trillion notes, um, uh, and you still couldn't buy anything. There was nothing on the shelves. People talk about um, <clears throat> if you go out to have a few beers on Friday afternoon. Everybody would fight to buy the first round because the last round would be more expensive. The inflation. Um, in the midst of this, there was an election. It was um, contested, meaning that most people believe that um, the opposition leader actually won the election. The election was declared. Um, Null and void, essentially, and there was a do-over that was declared. A lot of violence occurred. Um, things really got bad. Um, there was a cholera epidemic soon after that. Um, the economy essentially collapsed. I think the estimate is that the GDP of Zimbabwe in 2008 or not, less than $5 million, which I think is lower than the GDP of this campus by quite a bit, right? Um, essential complete collapse of the economy. So that, that's the downside. That's the difficult part. This is a country that really went through a lot of uh, very difficult um, economic political times very recently, very soon before we started working there. But I think, you know, it's easy to talk about those difficulties. I think it's important to talk about strength as well. And this slide illustrates a couple of them. One is an incredible commitment to education. So I think these statistics that I have up there from adult literacy rates, um, they're probably about 10 years old now. It's probably not quite as high as it was then. But nonetheless, um, of the countries in sub-Saharan Africa, Zimbabwe had the highest adult literacy. Um, one of the first medical schools on the continent. Um, are, and that commitment to education, I think, is me, at least, um, traveling there and working there is, is um, very, very evident indeed. Um, giving us something really to build on, that when we uh, were asked to go and help develop faculty there, um, you really felt like you had people who um, believed in education, bought into it, came into it with relatively um, good skills, high levels of curiosity. Um, and then the other thing I can't really give you a statistic for is, I don't know, desire to work hard, work ethic, um, really, again, evident in the culture of this particular I found, found and still find fairly striking. Um, and so on that background, this was the, kind of the problem that we were asked to address here, um, is that cardiology, manpower, and infrastructure was severely limited. So, you know, when the economy collapses, who gets to leave? It's the people who are, you know, fairly well off, elite. Um, the physicians left the country in droves. Um, more than 60% of the medical school faculty left, um, leaving only two physicians with um, any advanced training in cardiology um, left in the country. They had um, lost tremendous capacity to do um, things. They, up until 2006, were doing, had a pretty robust open heart surgery program, had invasive cardiology program. All that stuff disappeared um, when the people who knew how to do that stuff left the country. So kind of left with... Um, Nothing. Um, and not only was the cardiology 
faculty cardiology capacity gone, but the um, problem of cardiovascular disease was still there. I think non-communicable disease really highly prevalent in southern Africa. I'm going to show you two things to back that up. So this is a really busy slide. This I can't expect anybody to get anything from this slide, um, but I'm, I'm going to point out a couple of things. On it. So this is a pretty recent article on, on global cardiovascular uh, burden of disease, um, and um, shows that um, several things. So it shows that the, the, the prevalence or the numbers of people dying of cardiovascular disease um, overall across the world is going up pretty markedly. And so on the left-hand side of the screen, you can see that that's uh, Western Sub-Saharan Africa essentially doubled, percent change of about 100% over this uh, almost 25-year period. So, but why is that? And so what the gray bar tries to do is say how much of this is just because the population got bigger. The brown bar says how much of this is due to the aging of the population. And then what's left over is the blue bar. How much of this is due to epidemiologic change? How much of this do, is due to the actual epidemiology of the of cardiovascular disease changing. And there's been this idea, this um, concept of epidemiologic transformation, idea that um, heart disease occurs in, uh, in middle-income countries, wealthy countries, doesn't occur in poor countries, right? And as countries become more wealthy, more developed, that you're going to have more cardiovascular disease. And this slide kind of puts the lie to that. Um, and it's really only one region where there's a statistically significant difference in the epidemiology of cardiovascular disease. Um, and that's this western part of sub-Saharan Africa. All, all other places in the global south here um, does not demonstrate this growth in cardiovascular disease as countries become more wealthy. The point is that you know, I showed that slide with the global burden of disease in Africa being so large. The point is that cardiovascular disease is there, and it's this infectious disease that we all think of is layered on top of that, right? Cardiovascular disease is a part of what we see um, throughout the world. It's not something that countries transform into. It's there. We're not seeing it. And I think to make a, a bit of a philosophical point, I think that there's this tendency we all have to see this part of the world as, you know, somehow exotic or different or you know, has a stuff. I don't, don't see it that way. I think you know, there clearly is a burden of disease that is different than what we see, but it's not that different. It's not that, that you know, the global south is not that different from us. So this is a different way of making the same point. So this is uh, um, not a rigorous epidemiologic study. This is an informal epidemiologic study. This is the first 10 patients I saw on um, rounds when I was there uh, in Harare a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I just, you know, I write down all the patients we saw on rounds. Um, this was the, the first 10. Um, and I don't, I don't know if there's any residents here, but they had 32 admissions that um, remarkably busy. And so I think what there's a couple things that jump out at you here. First is on the far right there, there's, there's a lot of HIV, right? A lot of patients have HIV. So five of the 10 patients were HIV positive, right? The other thing that strikes me when I look at this is on the left column there, that age, pretty young, right? There's a lot of disease, a lot of illness in relatively young people. I think if you did this same exercise, University Hospital, Denver Health, something like that, the average age would be um, higher than what you see here. With the average age at Denver Health being lower than what you would see at Rose or at um, University Hospital. Um, but the other thing that I want to point out about this is that uh, for four of the 10 patients, it was a heart disease that was the um, presenting problem here, right? So stroke. Uh, big problem. Every, I think every time I've rounded, I think there have been one or two or three patients with stroke that have been in the admission code. Um, heart failure, uh, patient with mitral stenosis who developed atrial fibrillation, went into severe heart failure as a result of that. Um, saw a patient with a myocardial infarction. That might have been a little bit of an outlier. There's not quite as much 
am I as, uh, I, that's not as common a thing for me to see. But um, again, they're just like it is here. That's kind of point one that I wanted to make. Non-communicable disease, cardiovascular disease, a problem um, everywhere. Um, and so, so that's the statement of the problem. That's um, where, we're, uh, where we're coming from. And so what did we um, do? The, the real thrust of what we were asked to do, what we decided to do, was to try to redevelop the faculty, right? That without a robust faculty that has the ability to take care of these conditions, you're not going to make any progress. And so we focused on a selected group of postgraduates, selected by the faculty there as having um, uh, particular interest and talent in, uh, in cardiovascular disease. And we were asked, and what we decided to do was to really simultaneously develop clinical skills and research skills. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that is and how we did that. This photo here is actually a couple of our trainees, and that x-ray is of somebody with pretty severe mitral stenosis for find in, in the bunch here. And so, as I said, our objective was to develop a small group of junior faculty with um, region-specific qualifications in cardiology. With the amount of money that we had, the time, the effort, everything we had, we really couldn't do the kind of cardiology training that you would expect here. So, um, cardio, you know, to become a, a qualified cardiologist now, you do three years of internal medicine and three or four years of full-time subspecialty training not going to happen. We weren't going to be able to do that. So we really honed in on what we kind of call region-specific qualifications in cardiology. What problems are you seeing there? What do we really need to do to get you started so that you can deal with the kind of disease and problems that you're going to see most there? Um, <clears throat> the other concern, um, strong on the part of the faculty, was that they did not want a lot of off-site training uh, for two reasons. One is that they really needed these guys. Um, there were very few people entering training in 2010, um, uh, and they needed these guys to be around, um, and they needed to be have them working um, in the hospital. And they also were very concerned about people, giving people an avenue to leave the country. A brain drain was clearly... Um, so what we hit on as a way of doing this, and it's turned out um, to, I think, be effective, is that they uh, did we several things. Early on, they do a one-month rotation um, <clears throat> at the University of Cape Town, um, Grutesker Hospital, um, which is actually a pretty famous hospital from a cardiology standpoint. It's where the first heart transplant was done in 1968. Um, kind of interesting. So they had a real tradition of, of, of excellent cardiovascular um, clinical skills there. So they go there, they see sort of something that's sort of halfway in between what you might see here and what you might see there, um, uh, have the opportunity to do some hands-on stuff. We have people come here um, as a group. We usually have a group of three or four people here at a time for two weeks in Denver to um, round with us, uh, um, just kind of see how things are done here. Um, that's been um, useful. Uh, and then we do uh, didactic and clinical train, uh, uh, teaching over there. So we have a group of five or six um, cardiology faculty that go over for one or two weeks a year. Um, we, we do at least eight weeks a year through the, the last four years. Um, one of us is over there doing some teaching. Um, the other thing I think that's been really important is that they are required to develop and complete uh, a research project. And we've been pretty prescriptive about what those research projects are. We have people doing um, um, very clinically oriented things in outcomes research. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. But we sort of um, have had people say, we want you to choose a given condition, and we want you to Keep track of all the patients you see with that condition in a very rigorous kind of way. Um, you know, we want elements of the history and the physical and the lab exam and all that sort of stuff kept in a computerized registry. So that um, does two things. One is it forces um, building of clinical skills. Um, the second thing that it does is forms a substrate for lots of future research. Um, so that 
you know, we have, and I'll talk about this, but we have guys that have developed a, a registry of all the patients admitted to the hospital with stroke. And so um, the uh, lead uh, postgraduate on that project just uh, finished a paper uh, on their experience with that, um, and they have plans to write a couple other papers out of all that work that they did to get those patients in there. So great substrate for research. Um, it also um, is a way to feed back onto the clinical care, and uh, that stroke project that I mentioned has so far been the best example of that. Um, the um, uh, guy who did the stroke registry, I think it was, he probably had about 100 patients in there um, uh, that he had recorded. And what he documented was that their inpatient mortality for stroke patients was around 25%. Really kind of brought them up short. They, you know, if you see a few patients here and there, you don't really realize that that a quarter of their patients were dying in the hospital. Um, really striking. And they found that about half of them were dying of uh, aspiration pneumonia, of pneumonia and died. And so what they decided to do was to um, develop a stroke unit. So they got eight beds on one ward um, that were um, they were in charge of, that they could have um, the only patients that were admitted into those, the two four bedrooms are uh, patients with stroke, and all the stroke patients that they could, they would admit to that ward. Um, turns out that there were more, generally more stroke patients than beds in that unit, but nonetheless, um, they um, developed some very simple protocols. They had nurses who knew that um, the thing you don't want to do the first night that the stroke patient in the hospital is feed them until someone's had a chance to assess whether or not they can swallow. Um, and so just a really simple thing like this. Um, you know, not the best study design, but in the first six months, uh, the mortality in the stroke unit was uh, 12 or 13%. So roughly half, roughly half of what it was before. Um, so um, this research project then feeds back onto clinical care in a way that improves clinical care. Um, that's been our biggest success story, um, but I, hopefully we have a few others in the works. Um, concentrated exposure to cardiology in patients and outpatients. So they, they started a cardiology clinic, so um, these the, the trainees themselves staff it or man it. So all of the cardiology patients are seen on Wednesday morning between 8 and 12, and um, they just wind up seeing a lot of these patients um, talking to each other about how they get managed. When one of us is over there, we precept in clinic, um, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then they've also had some, not through our part of the grant, but through the larger um, uh, MEPI grant that we have, Colorado has with them, um, they go to have had some teaching skills workshops so that they not only become better clinicians, have some uh, beginning of a research career, but also become better teachers. Um, so um, a little bit more on clinical skills. We've really focused on echocardiography. Um, it's a non-invasive thing. Um, it's extremely helpful for many of the conditions that are more prevalent, uh, and I'll talk about those later on. Had um, a couple of people focus on uh, EKG and arrhythmia detection. Um, again, non-invasive, inex relatively inexpensive materials um, for doing that. Um, we've had one person that we have uh, trained in pacemaker implantation. Um, there was one guy in the country who could implant, not in Harare, he was in the second smallest city, Bluaya, which is probably a four-hour drive away. So basically, if you had a condition you needed a pacemaker for, you were kind of out of luck. Stable enough and you had money, you could go to another country, but kind of out of luck. So this was, after seeing a couple bad things here, we decided to do this, and it's been Helpful. And we also really focus on outpatient management of cardiovascular disease um, because chronic disease, it's something that really focused on long term as an outpatient. That's the clinical skill development, as I've mentioned, research skill development, uh, patient registries. I've already talked about this inpatient stroke registry. Um, the first one we started, uh, the most successful in terms of. Um, uh, 
feedback on the clinical care system. We've had somebody work on um, pediatric rheumatic heart disease. I'll talk a little bit more about rheumatic heart disease in a couple minutes. We have somebody who's focused on peripartum cardiomyopathy, um, a condition that talking about that. So this is a here in the states. It's a rare condition. It's not rare in Southern Africa, uh, where uh, women typically within a few weeks after delivery, the case definition is up to six months after delivery, but usually within a few weeks will show up with heart failure, uh, with weakening of the heart muscle for reasons that no one understands. Um, so it's kind of a doubly devastating condition. So not only is the patient severely impaired, but this is the mother of an infant who now, uh, so the infant um, is put at risk as well by this condition. Uh, and then we've had um, three people um, working on inpatient heart failure. One is just on 30-day um, mortality. Um, I just, in the last time I was there a few weeks ago, saw the data there. Um, turns out that their 30-day mortality is really, is very high. It's um, uh, about 40% of patients who've been admitted to the hospital, leave the hospital, die within a month. Um, very high. And we just started talking about what we need to do to fix that situation in a way that it's analogous to what we did with the stroke thing. We had somebody look at atrial fibrillation as well as ventricular arrhythmias as well. Those two things are important because they kind of feed into the solution to the 30-day uh, mortality thing. Striking finding from the atrial fibrillation is that the, the prevalence is pretty high, um, uh, as is the prevalence of ventricular arrhythmia. It's kind of unexpected. And if we have time, I can talk a little bit more about why we didn't expect the arrhythmia problems to be what they are, but, but they're pretty high. Registries, I think, are not just useful for um, research skills, um, but they are useful clinically for improving care, for moving care forward. Yeah. And so that's the core of what we've done. We've done a few other things. One is uh, we have, uh, at least the first year we were there, we took over the cardiology um, section of the physiology classes for the second year medical students. Um, and we did all 24 lectures there. We revamped kind of the the slide set and the, the thrust of teaching, we made it much more clinically oriented um, and, and cut down the number of lectures and gradually over time turned over um, the responsibility for that to the postgraduates that we were teaching. So they have done many of these lectures. Got roped into doing these again last year. Uh, I would like By and large, um, we have kind of use this as a way to get people back into teaching. On some clinical lectures for the fifth year medical students, this is one of us giving fifth year students, that's analogous to third year medical students here, so it's their first clinic, clinical exposure to internal medicine. Yeah, here's I just want to, oh. so, this like, so I just wanted to just talk about um, the results. So these are the, I think there's, I can't remember, there's like 10 or 11 people here. So these are the, the, the people that we um, started working with. So the, the first 
four people. That's from our first cohort that we brought in in 2011. And, you know, we've been really successful. We haven't lost anybody out of the program. I kind of thought that we'd have people drop out of the program, that they wouldn't cut it, but everybody has stuck with it. Everybody's been really, has done everything we asked them to um, from this core group. And so the first guy there um, is actually in pediatrics, um, and we've um, gotten him some additional training in pediatric cardiology. He's the guy that worked on um, rheumatic heart disease, um, so rheumatic heart disease uh, is a really big problem. I have so um, on the bottom there. So the glo global annual mortality from rheumatic heart disease is to about a quarter of a million people a year. So in contrast to HIV, which is over a you know, million and a half a year, it is smaller, but it's not trivial at all. It is not trivial at all. The other thing that is um, important about it is that the poorer the environment you live in, the younger you get the disease. Um, it's a condition that is uh, so just those are not aware. It's a uh, it's essentially a reaction to strep pharyngitis, right? So you get a strep throat. A few weeks later, in depending on the strain of, of strep and probably your genetic predisposition, you develop um, inflammation of the heart, um, something called acute rheumatic fever, um, then goes into a chronic phase where there's this chronic low-level inflammation that creates scarring of the valves um, and eventually creates significant heart failure, requires valve replacement or um, um, some sort of valve surgery, right? So the poorer the environment you live in, the younger you get the disease. So white middle class Americans don't get it. It just doesn't happen. You get um, penicillin for strep throat. There's just not enough of this um, bad strep around that you get it. Um, in um, some, um, you still see it, at least we still see it in Denver Health um, in some uh, people who are immigrants from um, Primarily Mexico, to some extent Central America, um, some uh, poorer people from the United States as well. Typically shows up in the 40s, in your ages 40, maybe early 50s, something like that. In, um, I have seen patients in um, Zimbabwe with significant heart failure, like I can't get out of bed um, kind of heart failure. Um, the youngest patient I've seen is eight years old. And everybody that I've talked to said, oh, yeah, I've seen five years old as well. Um, so it's a, it's a pediatric disease there, essentially. Um, um, and so, yeah. I apologize for messing up my stuff. Anyway, so that's our, our first trainee is really focused on that. So he is uh, f finished his postgraduate training, is in this kind of transition year that they refer to as being a registrar. You're sort of like the junior attending on a service. Um, he has been interested enough in this um, and really wants to do more with this and secured for himself a, uh, an abbreviated pediatric cardiology fellowship in Cape Town. Um, and is going to go away for a year, kind of leave his wife and kids largely behind and, and go study cardiology for a year and then come back on faculty. Um, his, uh, the work that he did on pediatric rheumatic heart disease is uh, he's getting that published. Uh, it's actually coming out next month in the South African Medical Journal. Real success story for us. Um, we've had a, an adult cardiologist who's moved on, has actually joined the faculty. This is the person that we've um, trained to do pacemaker implantation. He, as um, is the case here, is more focused on um, the procedural aspect of things, less on the research aspect of things, but nonetheless is a success story. I talked about Andrew here with uh, um, in neurology, who's really focused on stroke. Um, he's finishing up. He'll, he'll be joining the faculty um, in February, I think. Um, our, the fourth member of our first cohort kind of dropped out for a year um, for, to have a family. She's back in, um, has been studying peripartum cardiomyopathy. Really, I think, is much more interested in doing research long term. And we're looking to for her to do a a year of research in South Africa on this topic. So, you know, I mentioned that this is kind of a rare condition. The incidence in Southern Africa is at least four times. Some papers would say it's up to 10 times the incidence here. So 
it's a pretty rare condition here. It's, um, um, I think, a cardiologist for like 25 years, I probably have seen maybe five new cases um, during that time. Um, Elise, in, in a year and a half, collected, she has a, a, a group of 70 women that she follows um, with this. Um, really pretty common there and um, is pretty motivated to try to understand why this happens. Um, and so, as, uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to seek out. The other guys are coming along. So at the bottom of the slide is, is also something I, I did want to uh, bring some attention to. Um, because unexpectedly all the people that we trained worked out, they learned this stuff, they stuck with it. We, had, we were starting to develop more cardiologists than we thought uh, was needed initially. And so uh, we got permission from NIH to expand. Actually, more than permission, we got encouragement to expand beyond cardiology. So we have a couple people um, that are uh, doing some training, sim very, very similar model in endocrinology, and di particularly in diabetes. That's where the big need is. Um, in diabetes, um, and uh, they're probably going to open a di inpatient diabetes unit similar to the stroke unit I mentioned in the fall. Um, we've also um, uh, gotten a couple people some training in adult uh, pulmonary medicine, um, and they've really taken off as well. Um, they have really learned bronchoscopy and are doing a lot of a lot of bronchoscopy in patients uh, with HIV and TB have a very large, pretty large series that they've developed on patients with Kappa C sarcoma of the lung. Um, they're also starting to work on developing improved capacity in the intensive care unit there. I kind of think that that's... I wanted to talk for about 45 minutes, I think I have, and so I'll just sort of pause, stop, end here for questions, comments, discussion, whatever. Dave, you've, how many times have you been now? We make it up half the time, right? <laughs> yeah, and I think it's really true, and, and it's, and, you know, I, I, I kind of talk about this optimistically and that there's a lot of great things, but there's, it's, it's, it's a big problem. The solutions to this are still years away. So, I, you know, that my first 10 patients there with the, the patient with mitral stenosis, he died in the hospital. I, you know, been with very severe stenosis and developed atrial fibrillation, which makes that whole situation worse. And, and they were talking about getting him into for surgery, there's some very limited kinds of open heart surgery, not open heart, but there's some very limited kinds of heart surgery you can do to treat this condition. They were talking about getting them in and didn't kind of make it. E, something we need to work toward dealing with. And so hope is that between developing people who can do this kind of stuff, um, hopefully some improvement in the investment in the hospital itself that we'll be able to start to op offer open heart surgery again within the Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, you know, we're kind of doing that. I mean, part of the reason is that 
this grant ends. It ends at the end of July. So it's been it's been five years, um, and we have a few a couple of smaller grants. I'm not named on either of them, but we have something to kind of keep this partnership alive. But by and large, this effort's kind of going away. And, um, um, one of the gratifying things I saw, you know, in the last couple of weeks over there was. A couple of the people from that first cohort training somebody who's a new first year in their postgraduate program to do an echo, right? And um, um, I mean, that was kind of what you hope for, right? That people that we have trained can turn around and starting to see that. How sustainable is that um, remains to be seen, I think. That, yeah. We're starting to see that. The other thing that was really interesting is um, that so when they when the guys come over for a couple of weeks, at the end we ask them to do to take they um, uh, part of the evaluation is that they're given a camera, right? When they first come, they're supposed to take pictures for two weeks, and then the last day they're supposed to pick out pictures and um, sort of do a little slide presentation. And um, there's been a couple, several themes and things we've seen consistent. But one of them is uh, pictures of people on rounds. And they see how we do um, training, teaching, rounding, relating to each other very different, that it's much less hierarchical, much more um, what they would describe as respectful of each other. And so this idea that um, how you um, train or teach or relate to people that are at a different rank than you is much more sort of equal here. and. Um, they've really embraced that, and so that when they start, very different way than it had been done before. I'm hopeful that it will actually work. Yes. Um, Yeah, it does in, in a couple of ways. You know, um, so one thing is that, yeah, some of the, the technology is not that available, but those simulations, yeah, they're, they're not, that's to me not the foundation of, of teaching people. So that, that's not as big a problem. The access to the internet was a big problem. I remember the very first time I went, I just, you know, I was doing a lecture to the fifth year medical students. I just said, before I start lecturing, just tell me what the biggest problems are. You know, problem one, problem two, problem three was, you know, we have no internet access, essentially. It's so slow, we can't download stuff. So um, access to um, the grant spent a large chunk of money improving internet access. And that um, and so um, that aspect of technology is as available there as it is. So people here might say, well, I'm going to supplement the lecture I got today in physiology with something from the Khan Academy. You can do that in just as well as you can do that in Saudi Arabia, just as well as you can do that. Um, so um, there's that aspect of things. The other thing is, you know, the constant message that I've tried to give is, the technology is just not that not as important as you think it is. There's this sense that, um, well, you know, we can't do what you can do, so it's okay to have forty percent of our heart failure patients dying, or it's okay, or it's expected to have five percent of stroke patients dying. It's not, you know, the. Heart failure, you know, 90% of the treatment is with three cheap drugs that you have in Denver that they have there in Zimbabwe, no different at all. So it's really, I mean, I really try to de-emphasize the importance of technology. That there's sort of this belief that technology is magic. Is it really?
No, no, it's true. The other, the other thing that's, that I think we don't fully appreciate here as much is that there is kind of a middle ground, right? There's this um, cheap technology. I, I don't really even, I don't know too much about it, but there's, for instance, you know, Dave brings up the ultrasound echocardiography stuff, right? So um, the, the echocardiography, uh, it it's a, costs around 400000 um, no reason why you shouldn't be able to do 90% or 95% of that with a machine that costs $10,000 or less. That stuff here. No incentive to develop that. That being said, people in India, people in China are focusing on that kind of technology solution. I think it's reasonably likely that, you know, We'll go back there in a few years, and what we do, the way we do things, and the way what we brought them will be displaced by um, people with hope. Not enough, not enough. So uh, we have brought over two cardiology fellows um, in the course of this. And actually, both of those guys are now have joined the faculty and have continued to work with the program. Um, I'm gonna, there's another guy that's starting this summer that I'm going to bring over. So we've had a few cardiology fellows who've um, really become very engaged in this kind of stuff. Uh, internal medicine residents, to my knowledge, I think there's been one chief resident, maybe one other person. Um, it's me. It's just a it's tragic missed opportunity. I mean, what our residents could learn over there is just it's just it's it's tremendous. I mean. This whole way of thinking, and, and it's like, if you have to go to the family and say, can, do you guys have $400 so that we can get a CT scan on your father? You, you think about whether or not you really need that in a way that our residents, I, all, our, all our physicians could learn from tremendously. Uh, I, yeah, no, so it's been, it's terrible. We just haven't done very much of it. Here's a little, here's a, yeah. So a few things. So one is that, you know, at least with one of the grants, so one of the, one of the guys who's a fellow, David Kao, who's now joined the cardiology faculty, he wrote a grant with one of our investigators over there to do IT development. Um, uh, and so David's going to go because he's got funding now as part of this grant. 
He personally, I'm going to keep going even if it's on my vacation. I just, if I buy my I'm going to keep going once a year. I just, I, I really feel like I got these guys close to, or I, I didn't do it, but I think we've gotten these guys close to the top of the mountain and they're not there yet. And I, ju you know, we just need to keep going. I think, and, and I, and I think there are a few other people going to do the same thing just on a totally on a volunteer basis. Um, and I think I have uh, another fellow who's going to apply for a Fogarty grant. That's, we're we're going to do what we can. I think it's, you're alluding to the fact that these are established relationships. You've got to maintain them. Uh, interesting. So, um, but it's my wife is a neonatologist who goes just because she doesn't want to go over there. And she's done a lot of um, work with nurse midwives, the pediatric residents on neonatal resuscitation, just met with USAID last week. And they're pretty weak there. Don't have a lot of money, but um, they're going to, there are some other organizations um, that may be in a little. Um, USAID has not been helpful. CDC has at least one person there all the time. Yeah, no, not not a part of it is political, right? I mean, it's you know, not a lot. There's not a big political investment in Zimbabwe because of the. I, I, you know, I think we were talking about this before. I mean, we just, you know, I think Colorado has to make a commitment, has to put a little bit of, of resource into this too, because it is part of how we're going to teach people to be physicians. You know. Yeah, I was going to say, Steve, do you think we can talk you into this? <laughs> so here, so, yeah. 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 Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, I, I, I think in, in the other version of my talk here, there's one of my slides is just, it's a big picture of a tree because I think what, what I really want to, you know, try to emphasize is what this work is doing. You're planting trees. You're taking, you're planting things that take years and years and years. Oh, you know, these, these are not going to be fixed overnight and,
We have. We have. Um, so there's a couple things. Um, one is bandwidth. <laughs> it's hard to do. Other is time zone change. <laughs> it's eight hours. And the other is just, I don't know, they just, it, it hasn't caught on. They just don't kind of, doesn't work. They don't like to do it. I mean, it's uh, even conference calls are hard to get going. So, yeah, I mean, initially that was a big part of the way we wrote the grant. Oh, we're going to do these video conference. It just, it has, it, it doesn't work. I mean, some things catch on, some things don't. That hasn't caught on. Maybe in the future. I don't know. Oh, thanks. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I could, yeah, yeah, gotta shut me up. I'd keep talking forever if you let me.